Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as subacute thyroiditis. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So subacute thyroiditis, if we were to actually look at the word thyroiditis, thyroid refers to the thyroid gland, and itis refers to inflammation. So this is a condition involving inflammation of the thyroid gland. It's also known as the Quervain's thyroiditis. We're going to talk a bit more about some of the subcategorizations of this condition later on in this lesson. So again, it's an inflammation of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a small gland in the neck area located around in this area here. So again, it's inflammation of that gland. And the thyroid gland itself produces and releases thyroid hormone, T3 and T4, or triiodothyronine and thyroxine. So both of those hormones are involved in metabolism, mentation, and movement. Now, this condition is often preceded by a viral infection. Oftentimes, what happens is a patient will have a viral infection two to eight weeks prior to the onset of this condition, and it's oftentimes going to be an upper respiratory tract infection. And some of the viruses that can lead to this condition include Coxsackie viruses, A and B, echoviruses, influenza viruses, measles, and SARS-CoV-2 has also been implicated as a potential cause of this condition as well. Now, this condition is actually going to most commonly occur between the ages of 25 to 35 years of age. The reason as to why it occurs in some individuals is not entirely known, but it may be related to human leukocyte antigen B35. There's also an increased likelihood of having this in the postpartum period as well. And there also seems to be seasonal changes in prevalence because there are seasonal changes in prevalence of the viruses we talked about before. So because there are changes throughout the year in the prevalence of upper respiratory tract infection viruses, this also goes along with the prevalence of this condition as well. Let's talk about some of the subtypes of this condition. We can narrow it down more specifically into subcategories depending on whether the thyroid gland is painful or painless. In the case of painful types of this condition, trauma can be a particular cause, radiation can also be a cause, and infections can also be a cause. So we just mentioned that upper respiratory tract infections are oftentimes going to be what precedes the onset of this condition, but there can be other causes, including trauma and radiation. And with regards to painless cases, these can be caused by autoimmune conditions, and medications. But in this lesson, we're going to more specifically focus on the painful thyroiditis as opposed to the painless thyroiditis. But a lot of what we're going to talk about can apply to the painless variety as well. If it is painful, it's going to be known as de Quervain's thyroiditis. Now, there are different types of categorization of the categories and the types of this condition, but we're not going to get into all those details in this lesson. If it is painless, it's known as silent thyroiditis. So very important to at least distinguish between painful and painless. Let's talk about some of the pathophysiology as to what happens in subacute thyroiditis. So what happens is that giant cells, which are a conglomeration of macrophages and other immune cells, and cytotoxic T lymphocytes, these will infiltrate into the thyroid gland causing inflammation. So the thyroid gland becomes inflamed. That inflammation is going to cause particular changes in the thyroid gland. What's going to happen is the thyroid follicular cells will become damaged. These carry a lot of preformed thyroid hormone like T3 and T4. So there's going to be excessive release of the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. It's not going to be an overproduction of these hormones. It's going to be an excessive release of preformed thyroid hormone. Eventually, all of that thyroid hormone is going to be dumped out into circulation. And eventually, it's going to become depleted. And then what happens is it's going to take time for regeneration of follicular cells and thyroid hormone. So as you can see, there's going to be particular stages of this condition that are going to correlate with the underlying pathophysiology. So oftentimes what's going to happen is because there's going to be damage to those follicular cells and excessive release of thyroid hormone, this is going to cause a hyperthyroid phase or a thyrotoxic phase. So because there's going to be excessive levels of thyroid hormone, we're going to see possibly signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. We're going to talk more about this later on in this lesson. This hyperthyroid phase is going to last approximately four to eight weeks. 
And what happens is once the thyroid hormone has become depleted, it starts to level off. It'll start to decrease into normal ranges. And this can lead to a euthyroid phase or a phase of normal thyroid functioning. Although again, it's going to be temporary because the follicular cells themselves are not producing thyroid hormone. And this eventually can lead to an ultimate depletion of thyroid hormone in the blood leading to a hypothyroid phase. This phase can itself last up to eight weeks. And then what can happen is the follicular cells can regenerate and produce thyroid hormone to bring thyroid hormone levels back up into the normal range, again, back into the euthyroid phase. And it's important to note that a patient may not experience all stages. So they may experience a hyperthyroid phase and then skip to the hypothyroid phase. The levels may deplete very quickly into the hypothyroid phase. So again, they may skip some of these phases, but oftentimes this is going to be the course of what happens in this condition. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of subacute thyroiditis. So again, because this is oftentimes going to be preceded by a viral infection, especially a upper respiratory tract infection, there can be some associated signs and symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection that would have occurred about two to eight weeks prior to the onset of thyroid issues. So it's important to take a good history from the patient. These symptoms can include sneezing, runny nose, sore throat, and a cough. And what is going to happen is when there is thyroid issues, the hallmark finding in this condition is neck or throat pain. This is actually going to be the most common symptom of this condition. And what will be noted is that the throat pain, which is going to be located in the area of the thyroid gland, it's not going to be a sore throat. It's going to be a painful throat on the outside. If you were to actually touch it, it's going to be very tender. That pain can radiate to the jaw, the chest, and the ear. And it may be migratory. There may be some more pain on one side of the thyroid that will migrate to the other side of the thyroid or it can be bilateral from the beginning. And again, the thyroid gland, if it's actually to be touched, it can be very, very tender and it may become enlarged as well. It's also important to note that the neck or throat pain may not be present in particular cases, particularly postpartum cases and in cases of autoimmune conditions and certain medications like we talked about before, which would be considered silent thyroiditis. Patients can also experience, in some cases, systemic signs and symptoms like fever. Fever may be present, although it may not be present. And malaise, which would be a general feeling of being unwell, that may also be present as well. So patient may feel systemically unwell. They may have some fatigue, malaise, bodily aches and pains, or they may not. They may only have the neck or throat pain. But what I want you to take away here is that the most important finding in this condition is the neck or throat pain. Now, as I mentioned before, there are particular phases of this condition, and we also mentioned that a patient may not experience all these phases. If they do experience the hyperthyroid phase, it's going to be mild or transient. This is going to be the first phase that a patient may experience. And again, oftentimes the signs and symptoms are going to be mild, which means that the patient may not even notice them in a significant way. And they will last about two to eight weeks. Some of these include heat intolerance, excessive sweating, anxiety, tremors, increased appetite, but even with increased appetite, they may have weight loss. They can have hypertension or high blood pressure. So more specifically with regards to the hypertension, it's going to be increased systolic pressure. And with this, a widening pulse pressure, which would be the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures and tachycardia, which is a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. And with this, they may have an arrhythmia. But again, it's important to note that patients may not have these signs and symptoms. They may have hyperthyroidism on blood work, but they might not have these symptoms, but they could. So it's important to look out for these as well. As we mentioned before, patients may go into a euthyroid state, which would be a normal state of thyroid functioning, and then they can lead into a hypothyroid state, which would be a low thyroid functioning state. Again, this is going to be a mild and transient state. So patients can often experience signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, which can include cold intolerance, dry skin or hair thinning, depression, fatigue, decreased appetite, weight gain, decreased mentation, so decreased concentration and decreased memory, and bradycardia, which would be a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute. So again, not all patients will have these signs and symptoms, but they could, or they can be very, very mild and not even be something that may be significant to the patient. So it's important to look out for these and see whether or not they are actually having these signs and symptoms. Now, I do want to talk about subacute thyroiditis with regards to the postpartum period or after delivering a baby. And this condition may actually affect 
upwards of 5 to 10 percent of postpartum females. And it's not going to be symptomatic in all cases. We talked about this as a particular case where there may be a painless thyroiditis or a silent thyroiditis. So again, it's important to make note of that. So what can happen is in the two to three months of the postpartum period, there can be thyrotoxicosis, so an excessive level of thyroid hormones leading to possibly sign the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. And this will then transition into hypothyroidism at about four to eight months of the postpartum period. So again, there can be signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism like we talked about in the previous two slides. So I do wanna mention that the timing and the percentage of cases and some of the clinical findings can be slightly different in postpartum individuals. So I do wanna mention that here as well. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose this condition. Oftentimes it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. It's going to be determined by a history and physical examination. If the history contains what we've talked about before, some of those causes we talked about before, and there is especially throat pain, so if the thyroid gland is tender or very, very tender or painful to touch, that's going to be very important with regards to how clinicians diagnose this condition. But blood work and certain investigations can also be important in determining that this is subacute thyroiditis and not some other condition. So in the hyperthyroid phase, there's going to be particular blood findings. There's going to be an increased T3, increased T4, those are the thyroid hormones, they're going to be elevated. And there's also going to be a decreased TSH or a decreased thyroid stimulating hormone. The reason that there's going to be a decreased thyroid stimulating hormone is because these thyroid hormones actually negatively inhibit the release of TSH from the pituitary gland. So because there is damage to those follicular cells we talked about before, leading to essentially a dumping of thyroid hormone into the blood, that thyroid hormone is going to negatively inhibit the release of more TSH. So that's why you're going to see a decreased TSH on your blood work. Some other investigations that may also be undertaken in the hyperthyroid phase include a Ryu scan, which will show a low uptake and a color Doppler sonography, which would show decreased flow, which would be different than what you would see with Graves' disease, where you'd see increased blood flow. So that's important to also make note of as well. And then there can also be abnormal LFTs or abnormal liver function tests as well. And then once a patient proceeds through those other phases we talked about and depletes a lot of their thyroid hormone, it's going to lead to a difference in blood work going to lead to decreased levels of T3 and T4. So that thyroid hormone becomes depleted and you're going to see lower levels of T3 and T4. And now you don't have that thyroid hormone inhibiting TSH release. So there's going to be an increased level of TSH. So you can see that there's going to be a opposite trend that happens when we move into the hypothyroid phase. And a lot of times it's important to rule out other conditions that can lead to some of these hyperthyroid and hypothyroid issues. And looking at TPO or thyroid peroxidase is important and also looking at anti-thyroid receptor antibodies. So with regards to anti-TPO that would be found in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that's going to be negative in this condition. And then looking at anti-thyroid receptor antibodies, which are present in Graves' disease, that's also not going to be found in this condition. But what's also going to be found in this condition, because of that inflammation in the thyroid gland, you can see an increased ESR and CRP. ESR is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and CRP is C-reactive protein. These are measures of inflammation, and these will also be elevated. So it's important to make note of the fact that it can take weeks for some of these blood changes to actually appear. So it can take two to eight weeks between blood work to see if there is any change in your blood levels of these hormones. Now, how do clinicians actually treat this condition? A lot of it's going to be symptom control. So because there's going to be a lot of pain from the thyroid gland, it's important to have pain control. So a lot of times it's going to be NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. Oral corticosteroids may be used in certain severe cases Propanolol can also be used, so this is a beta blocker, can be used for more signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism, like tachycardia and tremors. More specifically with regards to hyperthyroidism or the hyperthyroid phase, 
A lot of times there's not going to be any need for medications. The symptoms of hyperthyroidism from this are often very mild or not present. So oftentimes a medication for those signs and symptoms are not going to be needed. But in some cases, iodinated medications may be useful to reduce peripheral conversion from T4 to T3. T3 is the active form. So again, that may be used in some cases. And in the hypothyroid phase, Again, oftentimes no treatment is required. If there is significant signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, there may be some utility in using levothyroxine, again, if there is significant signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. And it's also important to note that, again, a lot of this is going to be supportive because a lot of patients are going to recover from this condition. It may take weeks to months, but 95% of patients will recover. There are going to be a subset of patients that will have a chronic hypothyroidism from this condition. So that's also important to make note of as well. Recurrence may occur. So there may be a full recovery, but then there may be recurrence later. And that usually occurs in roughly 2% of patients. And then with regards to the cases that are more likely to last longer or become permanent, that chronic or permanent hypothyroidism, that's more likely going to occur in silent thyroiditis. So if it's going to be a painful variety, like we talked about before, that's more likely to recover on its own. And oftentimes patients will have a good recovery, but in some cases it can be permanent where a patient may be required to take levothyroxine chronically. So if you want to learn more about other thyroid conditions, please check my endocrinology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.